Good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. Uh, we are here with Ape Omede. Ape is joining us from Spain uh, this afternoon. So Ape, thanks again for uh, making our time to come join us and have this conversation this afternoon. Uh, I'm also here with Martin and my partner on this project, Martin. Um, so we just dive straight, straight in. Ape, could you just uh, give us a brief uh, introduction of yourself, you know, just tell us your background, where you've come from, and then um, kind of your journey, your journey so far from like academic background and and how you've come to, to where you are now. All right. Thank you very much, Obina and Martin. Thanks for having me on Outlander's Diary. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to come on board and share some of my um, my story is with you guys, and um, I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, this will go a long way to help a lot of uh, young people out there to you know, plan their life and plan their future. Uh, so like you said, my name is Ape Omede. I am from Nigeria. Specifically, I'm from Kogi State in Nigeria. I am an Igala by tribe. And uh, by training, I am an animal scientist. I had my first degree and my master's degree from the Federal University of Technology in Were, and then I came to Australia to complete my postdoctoral, my PhD rather. And um, uh, apart from being a trained animal scientist and a researcher, I am also an ag, ag tech um, enthusiast. Um, I help in building an agri food tech ecosystem in in Nigeria. Interestingly, from wherever I am, you know. Uh, based on the fact that I run a, 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 an organization with uh, some of my friends back in Nigeria where we empower agri food tech entrepreneurs. And uh, I also work with young people because I have passion in uh, inspiring young people to um, discover their excellent selves. So uh, talking about who I am, I am a researcher or an academic um, person, uh, an agri food tech enthusiast and a personal development um, expert. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. I come from a family of um, seven. I am the second child, but the first son. So laden with a lot of responsibility of looking after the younger ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up, I grew up um, uh, almost all my life in uh, Imo State. Uh, first, we were at Umidi, where I had my primary education and first half of my secondary education. And second half of my secondary education and then first degree and master's were all in Oweri. So um, more or less um, half Kogi and half Imo State or half Igala and half um, Ibo. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I hope you, um, I hope you married an Ibo woman. I was actually thinking, I would <laughs> and, uh, yeah, seriously, because um, I mean, the last thing that was in my mind was to go back to Kogi State and start looking for a wife because uh, I, I built lots of uh, friendship and relationship with a um, lot of people in Imo State, including mm -hmm. some very good ladies. But um, surprisingly, it didn't work out. You know? So I eventually had to go back to Kogi State to get married. Um, yeah, so um, I think after my master's and then... Um, doing a little bit of volunteering work with uh, my professor at FUTO. I got a job in Kogi State University and I went back um, to lecture for two years before um, I moved to Australia and that was when it all happened. <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool. And that means you have to travel, you have to travel far for your owner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, about your, your, your department in Futo was, I'm not sure if you mentioned that. Was, oh, was yeah, okay. I studied and I, I was in animal science and technology department. When we were admitted, okay. it was called animal production. And um, okay. it wasn't what I wanted to do, actually. I actually cried. Uh, but um, I can tell you, staying back in that department was one of the best decisions I made in my life. So um, I think it was in our town. I said that they changed it to animal science and technology. Okay. Well, what, what was what was your what was your what, what was the initial interest like? What, what my my initial interest my initial interest was in petroleum engineering, 
or industrial chemistry. And those were the two courses that I put in for um, when I was writing my jam and all that. But the fact was that I was influenced by the people we, I mean, we're all in, in class with in secondary school. I remember my friends, including this John Emanga that I mentioned that is in the UK now, we're all talking about petroleum, geology, mechanical, this and that. And we so just wanted to- like get, You can get a good, good job in Shell, right? So, uh, so yeah, I can make, I make money, you know? So um, we just wanted to flow with the, with the crowd and, all that and because of the way things are done back home in Nigeria there's nobody to really counsel you on, on career path to choose and all that so I mean we didn't have any solid information about what it could mean for someone to follow a career in agriculture so um, as a result of that I wanted to do petroleum or chemistry because I loved chemistry when I was in secondary school but that didn't work out and one thing leading to the other i just found myself in animal science hmm. yeah no, it's, it's quite interesting that most people that we you know this counseling thing is is something that is really lacking i think most schools have guidance and counseling but i didn't know if the students or the pupils Make as, as the case may be actually been you know they are, we are still, the people are still young then, so I don't know if it's not effective enough. Because me, myself, and many people I know, we all wanted to go to Fito and study a course so that we can come out and get a job in Shell. I am one of those people. I won't. I wouldn't deny it. Or, you know, get a, a job in Shell, get a job in Mobile, uh, and you know, it's just most people's stories. And then, but many of us found ourselves like you inadvertently in some other areas and then just really thriving and just loving it. Uh, Matthew, remember the last conversation? We had a, a chat with uh, <clears throat> a guy called Natina, you know, some, something similar as well. And then he found himself where he is and, you know, just blazing. He's a, a professor and just having the, an amazing career. So yeah. it's just, uh, just something, something yeah, you know, to, to think something, about. What, what, really stamped, what really stamped my, um, my feet on remaining in animal science was uh, I, I just one of the days I just had a thought and after listening to uh, so, uh, we had an orientation you know the normal student orientation and uh, um, I heard stories of uh, two of the professors if I mentioned them you may know them because you went you guys went to photo uh, and but the, apart from their stories I sat down one day and I asked myself what would happen if I have a farm of five thousand laying hens that lay mm. five minimum of 4,000 eggs every day mm. times seven days. And I mm. sell one egg for one naira. Mm. And I didn't think that any other company can pay me that <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so those kind of thoughts of mm -hmm. what is possible with what, you, what, you, what you're going into, if you yeah. can, you know, look, look for to look, look up, uh, try to look beyond where you are or what people are telling you and mm. try to dig into the possibilities. You know, so um, I didn't even know I was going to be into research and academics then, but at, at least this was one of the things that made me to like, okay, if it is money that we're looking for, I think that this profession will also give me the money if I want to go after money. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, 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 that's really good. And um, what, what year, what, what year as well? When did you finish from Fito? And I finished the, the yeah. master. Uh, okay, so I, I, I finished my first degree in 2003, went for service uh, in 2004, 2005, and then I came back for my master's in 2006. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that master's elongated until 2010, and uh, I couldn't even access my result and stuff like that until maybe 2011, 2012, lots of stories, lots of changes, you know, affected us and all that. But I, it took me four years, not because I wasn't ready, but of course, you know what, what it is like back home. And yeah. Uh -huh. I had to, I mean, you finish your pro program, you wait, you wait for another six months or one year to get your, your research going. You finish your research, you wait for another six months to get a, an examiner. Defense, yeah, yeah. And, you know, to defend your work and all that. So by the end of the day, I think I spent about four years between 2006 to 2010 to get to my defense. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. <clears throat> Martin, any 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 thoughts, any any comments? I was going to ask a question that, that goes way back to your initial introduction, actually. I just it just popped in my mind. I was curious how you ended up in Imo State being from oh. Kobe State. Oh, okay. Uh, my dad is a retired policeman, so that's how we ended up in Ah, uh, okay. He was posted to, uh, I think, I actually started from Bauchi State, but I can remember that I only spent wow. maybe one year in Bauchi as a student, as a primary school student, and then moved to Imo State on, on transfer. And I mean, the man didn't want to leave Imo State again. <laughs> <laughs> a, few year, a few years before his retirement, he went back to Kogi State, yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Right, let's, <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's, let's move straight on. So, uh, Ape, so you, you finished your, your, on your first degree, you finished, <clears throat> excuse me, you finished your first degree, then you finished your master's, uh, and then you started working uh, as a lecturer at uh, Kogi State University. Um, and you also just mentioned, you know, while you were talking that you never thought you were going to do research, you were going to find yourself in research. So, at what point did you start considering research and even now becoming a lecturer uh, at that point? Uh, okay, so um, I think the, the, it actually started with the idea of becoming a lecturer before I now realized that, okay, lecturing is even much more than going into the class. I mean, being in academics rather is more than, much more than going in the class and you know, giving out lectures and all that. So I, in my third year, um, one of the lecturers, I think, had a kind of a pep talk with us, you know, about what it, what it is like for him to be a lecturer. And I think that was when it first clicked, but still I didn't take it serious until I got to my final year and I met my professor, my supervisor, who I call my rich dad. Um, he told me something or he said something and that was that the classroom is his pulpit. And so he can make any influence, he can, I mean, impact any life from standing on, on the podium teaching, you know, students. So mm -hmm. that, uh, he said that the, the, the classroom podium is the largest stage in the world for anybody who wants to make an impact. Mm. in anybody's life and whenever he comes to the class he doesn't just teach us um ast 304 or ANP 501 or something like that he goes beyond you know just delivering the animal science aspect of his teaching to talking to us about life about future and on it and um um I just connected. I just wanted to, as I was growing and discovering who I am and the kind of things I want to do with my life, I realized that basically what I want to do is to make an impact. And um, I felt that. So what drove me into going for lecturing is to have an opportunity to connect with young people. I oh. asked myself, what would, be the, what would be the easiest way to have access to young people? If I want to impact young people and and then touch their lives in a positive way, what would be the easiest way for me to do it without, you know, you can, you can do it becoming a pastor or becoming a religious person, be in front of congregation, which I had opportunity to do over, over many, many years, but I just thought that to have a, a really, really great opportunity that is without bias of religion and all that, maybe this would be the, the, the best route for me to take. And apart from that, I also discovered that I love to teach. So teaching and passion to impact young people or touch people's life uh, came together to, um, you know, make me make that choice that this is the best thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Then when I went, um, as I was, you know, still thinking as a first degree student and coming back from my master's with the same supervisor, he exposed me to, to research. We're always reading um, uh, journal materials, journal articles, uh, magazines, and all that, talking about different kind of work that people have done. And interestingly, in my second year, uh, going back to what we said, how I became interested in animal science and all that, 
in my second year, I, um, I encountered an organization called World Poultry Science Association. And I was surprised that poultry science, just poultry chickens, has a global association. Uh, it was one of the things that, that also, you know, um, drove home my, my decision to remain an animal scientist, knowing that, okay, animal science is not just anything, but it's as big as having a global association for poultry as an aspect of animal science. So I, I joined the association and I was receiving their journals as a second year student. And whenever I get these journals, I read through them and I see the kind of works that are done outside of Nigeria, in other parts of the world. You know, so having those encounters, you know, drove me to become more interested in, in you know, stuff like that, that kind of job, finding out, um, I mean, making discoveries that will improve um, that field of study. So um, having a good supervisor who, who opened my eyes to what it would be like, you know, having an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to connect with young people and having a supervisor that um, you know, shows you the way in terms of what you can do with your knowledge and skills and ideas um, really, really contributed to making me decide to, to go into academics and then research. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that's quite interesting. You were reading, yeah. you were reading journals in second year. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, I don't know, but that was what happened. And oh, wow. I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity. My, sec my second year, I was just I was just thinking about the next course, how to how to pass, <laughs> how to pass the next course. I yeah. I couldn't I couldn't see past the semester to be honest. Like mm. if, so <laughs> if if for no other reason, Ozim, uh, for the fact that there was a particular course in our second year that I used to send shivers across everybody in engineering, uh, thermodynamics. <laughs> ah, yeah. Mm. So, so I didn't I, take that table dynamics, but we, we, we hear about it and uh, all the from, from our faculty in agriculture. So <laughs> Yeah, the whole school the whole school knew about it when you were doing. <laughs> yeah. So you had you had thermodynamics to deal with. You're not thinking about reading any journal from America. Uh, unless it's unless it's going to be somewhere in the exam. Uh, you, you you don't need it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good. And, and also, I just just to something you mentioned about you know the the classroom being a podium, you know, just like a pulpit for creating creating impact. I you know totally totally agree with that. You know, um, it's 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 really powerful in shaping young minds, especially. But we also, but I was also thinking, yeah, the same opportunity, you know, could be used for good, like you intended and you did. Yeah. But it also means that it's also open for, you know, for misuse, you know, exactly. for, use for, you know, um, purposes that are not so, so great. So if, if someone, a lecturer can stand there and influence the young ones positively, and also we have ones that could influence them negatively as well. Yeah, I was just, just thinking about that. Mm. Um, okay, no, that's 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 good, man. I think if you've, you've been built for this thing, man, like if you, if you were reading papers in your second year, Mm -hmm. and that's that's a good indication uh, okay so let's let's move on then you you um <clears throat> at some point while lecturing in the at the university at the kogi state university you started thinking about traveling abroad the, to to do to follow your studies so why why first of all i'll ask why did you why why australia first of all because i know you moved from there to australia why australia first of all and even beyond that question, why, what made you, what was the inspiration? What's, what motivated you to start thinking, okay, I probably need to step out to, to get better, to, for, for whatever reason you stepped out, what, what was the motivation and why Australia? Um, sincerely, sincerely, um, talking about what was my motivation, my simple motivation was, to study abroad, uh, I didn't really know what it meant per se. It looks like there is something that um, stands out in the life of people who studied abroad. Okay, like I, I mentioned to you, those two professors that were at the orientation we had in our first year both studied at Cornell. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, Cornell. Maybe it was because they studied at Cornell that they went far in, in their profession as animal scientists. And so, okay, 
if I can have an opportunity to study abroad, uh, maybe I will also go far as well and, you know, achieve as much as I could achieve. So, um, there is no, nothing really specific I can really hold on to that I would say that pushed me to, to you know, start thinking of um, studying abroad. I just wanted to have an opportunity to maximize that profession. Like if I, become, if I eventually become an animal scientist, I want to be in a position where I will get to any height as much as possible. And in my head, the only way to get to that height <laughs> was to travel abroad to study. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think, that it, I wasn't thinking like, okay, if I do my PhD in Nigeria or do my master's in Nigeria, I will still go that far, which is possible you know, depending on what you want in life. But all that was going through my mind was, okay, if you, you've fallen in love with this profession, you have to give your best to it to get as far as you can. And maybe one of the ways you can do that is by studying abroad. Yeah. 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 Um, Australia. So I ended up in Australia because I, um, I met someone who, who was... Um, uh, working in Australia then at a conference in Australia. Do you he understand what for, I mean? He went for yeah, a conference so, in Australia. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's, but wow. it was supposed to be the United States of America, but um, okay, so in 2008, when I was still doing my master's, through that same organization, World Poetry Science Association, I saw that they had these opportunities for young animal science, poetry scientists or people working in poetry science, students to attend the global conference in Australia. That was in, um, in, uh, in Brisbane. And um, I, I just applied for it. I did a review paper on um, assessment of, fish, of uh, commercial poetry feeds in Nigeria. And I submitted. And I was, the paper was selected, and I was selected among the 54 students all over the world. And I was, I was the only Nigerian who came from Nigeria. There was a second Nigerian who came from Turkey. He wasn't studying in Nigeria. He was, in, he was already studying in Turkey and was a PhD student. Uh, so he came, but from Nigeria, I was the only student. And in that particular conference, I met different kinds of people, researchers, professors from every part of the world. And two people I... I got stuck with was a professor, a Nigerian professor in the U.S. who is knew very, very well, who, who took interest in me and wanted me to come to the U.S. to work with him. And then this Australian professor as well, who is also from Nigeria. And so I just kept in touch with them. I, you know, when I came back to Nigeria, finished my program, got my lecturing job. Uh, I totally forgot about traveling abroad for a while, you know, and... Mm -hmm. Something happened leading to the other, and um, I had to, you know, get, get back again to to the the guy in the in Australia and told him, okay, I'm now ready to go to to go ahead with my PhD outside the country. And he said, okay, well, you can apply. And I applied, and I got it. It wasn't just Australia. I applied to so many places, you know, before I eventually got the one in Australia. And it wasn't like you know, you know, clicking for me. Uh, some schools in the UK, some in Europe as well, in other parts of Europe. And of course, of course, we are looking for funded positions. Yes, right? I was looking for funded position actually. Yeah. You know, the problem I had with the with the US opportunity was that he wanted me to repeat my masters. Like I finished my masters already in Nigeria, spent four years, like I told you. Now going back to do another masters didn't sound too well to me. Um, so I I wasn't really ready to take that opportunity. And so I just had to shift back to the man in the U.S., I mean, in, in Australia. And then I told him, and he said, well, you can apply if you get it. Why not? I'm happy to supervise. So I started applying to schools in Australia, including the university where I eventually got into. Mm -hmm. um, so basically it was as a result of my meeting those guys in that conference that led to me ending up in, in Australia. But I also remember that um, you know, uh, like I told you, from second year, I had started getting um, journals and some other material. So I was already um, aware of some of the schools in Australia doing very beautiful work in, in the field of animal science. So mm -hmm. um, somehow it wasn't really much a surprise. Probably it was what God wanted for me. 
Third year, fourth year, I was getting, I was writing the uh, Australian Center for International Agricultural Research to send me materials in Nigeria. And I would receive heaps of books like this, heaps of books from Australia as a student, you know. So I will read through it. I will see works that were done in Adelaide, works done in Melbourne, works done in Sydney, works done in Brisbane, different parts of Australia. And so ending up in Australia looked like maybe something that will eventually happen. But I mean, mm -hmm. this was happening in 2001, 2002, 2003. And I eventually ended up in Australia in 2013, 10 years ago. So, mm -hmm. yeah. mm. This, you know, the, the things you're saying, it makes me to go back. I know you've mentioned these two lecturers who, you know, kind of spoke to you, but I don't know how close they were to you. The, the, the reason I'm asking this is, I, I just while you're speaking, I know, I, I know your kind of people. There are people, um, yeah, there are people that, even while we're in university, there are people who are like your classmates or, or your age mates and stuff. But they, they seem to be, they seem to see things a bit farther away. And they seem to just, you know, just think up or do things that the, their, their mates wouldn't think about because it's, it's not coming from anywhere. Mm. And I, I later, I realized that most of those people have, you know, mentors. I, I know mentors is thrown about every, um, a lot around, but, but there is, there is that thing that mentors do because there are people who they see a bit, they've gone a bit further. So they just kind of drop things on you to, to do. But I would like you to talk about it. Were you doing these things like motivated by yourself or were you, did, was it those lecture, those professors that were having this impact on you? Apart from just speaking in classroom, was it, I mean, was there any mentorship that was, that kept you going because you, you were, you seemed to be like, years ahead of your peers as at that time really uh yeah well it, uh, <laughs> um so i think at a point mentoring came in but frankly speaking the, the initial stage of what was happening to me was not um influenced by um, um by by these lecturers because i think actually you know first year second year you do general general you need to you may not even know all the lecturers mm -hmm. uh, you only start getting to know lecturers in your department from third year or thereabouts so first year second year i didn't have any strong relationship with any of the lecturers so i feel that um what was happening to me at that at first stage was as a result of wanting to make my life count like I, I didn't want to just be an, an, an animal you know you guys in enjoy we're laughing at us we call us animal and all those things in those days <laughs> so it, it was an it was an inherited tradition we, we didn't know better <laughs> we just came to meet, meet the system that way so, <laughs> all Traffic those things had life. a kind of an influence on me to like it's like i wanted to just prove a point that you can be an animal science I, and my animals, an animal scientist, and still make a difference with your life. You can see, you can be an animal scientist and still stand out, you know. So there was this kind of personal um, something that was coming in, in. I mean, from my inside, you know, to the to the to the outside, that wants me to just um, separate myself, be be different, and still, you know. Uh, inspire other people who are animal scientists that this this thing is is possible. I remember that I think there's a question here about growing up and all that maybe we won't get it that I'll mention it, but I remember that I met I met a a, a a student who was a year a year ahead of me in animal science department and um, so the way it happened was that because of that I was seeking expression I was just trying to find a way to express myself anything i can do and all that so i was walking around and i saw the notice board i uh, departmental notice board you know where students you know write articles and posts i know every department had um, a kind of a board notice where students board. write articles or things like yeah. that so i saw one that belonged to animal science department and and one of these i saw him pulling out um the old materials to put on the new ones and then i went i walked up to him and i said uh, I would like to join the press club, the departmental press club, and all that. And he turned, he looked at me, and and then he said, "Bring me an article tomorrow." That was all he said. 
I was like, okay, bring you an article tomorrow. Then I went back to the hostel. I was just thinking of what to write. And I don't know. Eventually, I wrote something. Till today, I can't even remember what I wrote. I wrote something and I returned it to him the next day. He looked at it. He stood there. We were just standing and he stood there and he read and read and read and read and read and he turned. And he said, where have you been? I was like, um, I, I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean. He said, where have you been? So you can write like this and we're looking for writers in this department? It was just a year ahead of me. I was like, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. And he said, from today onwards, I want you to make sure you write one article every day. So th that guy was one of the first person who, who believed in me. And that made me to want to work hard to bring out whatever it is that I feel I have. So um, I was just giving out myself to trying anything that comes my way. When we went to a, the conference where I joined this association, I was literally the only student who took out my money and joined the association out of all the animal science students that came with me to that conference at Tugu DK. You know, so I would say, okay, that guy's influence, just one year ahead of me, you know, also contributed to just knowing that, okay, somebody believes in what you're doing, knows, knows yeah. that what you're doing is valuable, you know, helped mm -hmm. me to know, okay, I have some good to offer to myself yeah. and to the world. And then I began to try anything that I feel would give me an opportunity to express those things. But then in year three, year four, year five, I met these two guys. Um, eventually, the, my, my professor was the person who had the most influence on me. Um, he, he affirmed my work. Uh, so much that it, it, I mean, everything I do, he will always find something good about it. Because you're doing this very well. I mean, you can do this. You can. I like the way you write. I like the way you think. I look at your introduction. Like the first time I wrote my introduction and gave to him, he was like, uh, I mean, how did you come about this? You know, I mean, introduction for my final year um, project. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, well, I don't know. And I think he fell in love with me and started giving me more time to show me how to do it better. And I mean, he, he, he just keeps teaching me. Every time we come together, it's a time to learn something new. So first two, three years were like personal drive, trying to um, do whatever you can do to remain relevant. But then towards the end of my program, up until when I left Nigeria was the influence of this particular man. Mm. Yeah. Hmm, that's, that's that's really good. <clears throat> Martin, are you? Do you have any thoughts or you just? No, just very impressed with how he he approached some of those opportunities. Like you said, uh, Obin, uh, it's I would say it's uncommon for many of us, given that environment and at that stage. Yeah, it, it's not that we were not interested in opportunities. It was. It was, I think very often it was that even if opportunities were there, you couldn't even recognize them just because of so many other factors around. Yeah, but yeah. one of the things I picked up as you were talking as well was just looking back, when I look at the size of some of the departments in, in some of those other schools, like your school, um, School of Agri, and compare it to the size of departments in like engineering, I think it meant it was easier to build some better rapport with lecturers that could now serve as some kind of inspiration and motivation for you than it was. Because if I think back to like our own department, we'll be, no, I just, uh, no, none of such relationships come to mind or any lecturer that almost presented himself mm. as someone that individuals could align themselves to, to get ideas, to yeah. think up new options or, I think later as we approached uh, like fourth year, there was um, this, this lady that I think everyone was always looking forward to working with, um, Mrs. Chukudebe. And mm -hmm. she was that kind of example. But before her, all the way through, I don't think there was, there was that opportunity. So I think just looking back now, it's, it's, it's caused me to think actually that might have been a factor too. Yeah, yeah. There is this general um, notion, actually, that in, in, in SAT, that school of agri, that the lecturers uh, are more friendly, or were more friendly, at least when we were there, uh, more, more approachable. So, 
I, I, I feel I feel you have a point there, and that would have contributed to it too. You know, lecturers being able to freely share, and it's not as if it's every one of them, a few of them, but let's say more more of people who are like that than who, those who are not. Um, mm. uh, I mean, their doors are always open for you to come in and talk with them, and you know those kind of. You know, taking two minutes, three minutes out of your lecture to start talking to students about the future is, is quite common in, in South, at least during my time. I don't know what it is like, you know, today. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Ape, for that. So let's uh, let's let's just uh, move all the way from Africa now to Australia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, you you landed in Australia. I'll I'll just ask these two questions together. So. Um, what's what were what were you know many most of us when we travel for the first time you know we have this shock the, the core culture shock what, that we we kind of find out that things are really really not things are not exactly the way it, it was but it is back home you know we find that difference what were what were the biggest differences you found uh, you know in adjusting in life in Australia compared to Nigeria and what what were some of your you know, if you could remember any kind of early stories of, you know, you struggling to adapt uh, in, in, with the life in Australia. The reason I ask this question is, you know, someone, someone might be thinking or oh, it's close to traveling to Australia and stuff and the person doesn't know what to expect. So could you just touch on a few of those, of those things that make, made Australia different uh, from our, our background back in Nigeria? Yeah, okay. So excuse me um before i before getting to australia i was expecting um strong friendship strong community of support um people you can always fall, fall back on you know and stuff like that when i got to australia so the the first you know culture shock i got was that in australia uh, the life is very, very individualistic, even within themselves, like in a family of a father and mother, son and daughter, it is just like that. You know, a situation where a son can, can, cannot just take money from the dad and the dad will just like, oh, okay, just, just have it. But borrowing money from the dad and then find a way to pay back the money to the dad mm. and the dad will collect the money. Like, I mean, I, I just lent you this money, and so you have to find a way to give it back to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So that community life was not there for me when I first started. I had experiences where in the, you know, in a, in a shared office and space where everybody has his own desk or that, something like that. Um, and then a, an Australian student walks in, and you say, good morning, and you say, hey, good morning. And... Yeah. Three hours later, you meet the same person on the street, and the person just passes as if he or she had never, ever seen, seen you before. Yeah. It's like, what? I mean, it happened first time, second time, third time, and I was really taken aback. Is it, something, what is really, you know, going on? Is something wrong? Is it not the same person I just said hello to this morning? You know? And it wasn't just in the office. When you go to church, the same thing. The people you are living with in the apartment, I mean, maybe in the hostel or student uh, facility, student accommodation facility, you know, the same thing. And it was, I was getting worried because back home, I was used to, for, maybe say, for example, um, people asking you about how are you doing, how was your week and stuff like that. <laughs> when you go to church and the church is over, you meet with people, you, you can stay back for another 30 minutes talking and all that. You mean there is this, like, I want to catch up. I've not seen you throughout the week, so I want to, you know, kind, kind yeah. of catch up to know how you've been and all that. But when I got yeah. to Australia, in the office, like I said, I mean, students just, everybody just faces this as a job, and that just it. You go to church, nobody asks you where you're coming from, uh, what are you doing here, how has been your week and all that. So I felt left out from the community. Yeah. completely left out and to 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 even make it worse some of uh, our fellow africans some africans who were uh, i mean i met there were already behaving like australians themselves i mean mm. they don't even care that you're a black person some of them see you on the road and then on the street and they just 
they just pass and without saying anything. So the first challenge I had was um, uh, that culture shock of uh, individuality versus communal lifestyle. Mm. You know, uh, I, I got to know eventually that this is the their way of life. I mean, everybody's on his own. Nobody really cares. Yeah. Because you might even start thinking at the first time that maybe something is wrong with you or you know, there's something you're doing, not doing correctly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or somebody doesn't yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was when I asked, I started asking questions, like talking to people, I don't know what is happening. I, this guy, I just, I had an ex experience where I went for, we, I, I was a part of, um, I was a part of Enactus and I was part of some other students' uh, association. And then there was this lady that we were assigned to do a project together. Okay, so, we did, we were, even when we were still on that project, like the only time we interact with, were, was uh, during our meetings related to that project. After that project, I meet her in the shop in the evening. It's as if we, we hadn't had any discussion that day. And I was so pissed off. I was, what is wrong with this? You know, but then when I asked and they told me, oh, sorry, that's the way these guys do it. That's their culture. Yeah. I mean, if you meet for a meeting and then if there's no any relationship with them, that's just it. The essence of that is meet, do your discussion and then find your way. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the, one of the culture shock I had. Then the second one was, um, was food, but that's uh, because of my person. I have this phobia for food, for new food, you know, so I'm getting to Australia. Uh, I just suddenly realized that what I was seeing on TV, you know, as you know, you see it on TV and you be like, wow, if you, you just finish three plates of the food, I don't know. But then on getting to Australia, I realized that this is totally different from what I'm, I was used to. My, my goosey soup, my okra soup, gari, jollof rice, all those things were not there. So, and then converted, um, to, converted to burger. Yeah, well, I was literally, literally number one customer at KFC, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and all that. So when I, some of the communities I joined, like maybe church community and maybe some of the students organizations, so when they when they put up a kind of a get together and or when they invite you to their homes for lunch or dinner, I feel a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know which word to use, but you know they serve you a food and a plate of food and you just take the food like <laughs> you know so try and then they end up feeling like oh maybe he doesn't like it or something like that so uh, it was a big problem for me to you know fit in into the the food systems in australia trying to get you mm. what, what food that was available there and and all that. Sorry, I'll one yeah, there, just, just two more that uh, just came into my mind now. There is also this thing that uh, was quite a shock to me, or uh, maybe two. One is that you you can't you can't just you know when I was back in Nigeria, if my friends want to be, they don't even need to call me. I just get a knock on my door. You know, go, 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 and they say, oh, "Who is there?" He says, "John." Ah, John. Okay, give me a minute. You go and open the door. He comes in and you start chatting for the next three three hours. Your time mm. is disrupted and all that. But I realized it's in Australia. You can't go anywhere without booking an appointment. Like yeah. Your friend, fellow church member, fellow student in the same yeah. department, you want to visit. You don't do it without you know, put, you know, putting, putting a call through. First of all, to say, OK, do you have time? I want to come and see you or have some time with you. Or if he doesn't call you himself, to say, OK, I, I have some time. Can you come over for you know, stuff like that? It was quite surprising to me. You know, because when I was, when I started getting into the community gradually and started making some friends, uh, I thought I could just, you know, wake up and uh, go to their place and visit them. But I realized that was not possible. Then the second one was when there is a, a, a get together or a party, or even when they invite you for lunch, they say, bring a plate. They say, bring a plate. Yes. I don't know if that is if like lit lit like literally bring a plate from your home. <laughs> that was what many of us Africans were thinking. There have been situations where <laughs> I heard the story of uh, one lady from Kenya. She was a year, a year ahead of me or something like that. When when she first arrived, they invited her and the family to a, a family invited her and the family to dinner or something like that. 
and they said, please bring a plate. They, you know, this lady and her husband and the kids, everybody had their plate in their bag. <laughs> 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 so when they got to the, to the dinner and they were like, oh, oh, did you bring a plate? Did you bring a plate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We brought some plate and then they opened their bags and they bring it out. <laughs> and the family was like, oh, sorry, that's not what we meant. We meant that you should bring something to share with everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. so it um that the, the idea of somebody's inviting like if i'm throwing a party you know now in nigeria if i'm having a birthday or i'm celebrating yeah. something and i say hey open now martin come over you don't even need to bring anything you just come and eat i'll provide you everything. just come very hungry yes yeah. but when i realized that in australia when they invite you for lunch or dinner and something like that in fact, you, you, when you get used to it, you don't even need to think about it. Whenever somebody invites you for lunch or dinner, you make sure you go, you go through the supermarket to buy some snacks or buy some fruits or whatever, ice cream, just to bring along to share with everybody, which is not common in our culture that somebody invites you for, for, for lunch or for dinner and still expects you to bring some food along. Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> I just remember yeah. that. <laughs> okay, that's, 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 that's very funny. Um, yeah. And yeah, just just something related to that as well. Well, for me, to be honest, like I've had many people invite me over, <clears throat> you know, for lunch in Britain here, and you know, it's every it's proper proper lunch. In fact, sometimes they beg you, please don't don't come with anything. Everything is complete no. here. Um, that I've had I've had that, but also one I just remembered now is going like going to hangouts, you know, going to a pub or going to a restaurant or something. You know, there is this thing where back home if someone is asking you even if even if no one asks you to like say like three guys go out you know some guy one person just we just think that splitting the bills I'm just thinking about it now it's beginning because i've been here for a while it's beginning to become strange to me that we we'll hang out in nigeria and one person pays the bills most times yes because i've got used to you know if you're, if you're showing up hold your hold your debit card you know put your load your wallet you know because we are splitting i have a story with that <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so when man of steel came out when when man of steel came out and it was showing in the premiere in the cinema in 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 my town where i was living in australia we, I'm still, i mean my family is still there uh, so this guy invited i and uh, an ethiopian student i and this ethiopian student met <coughs> sorry this the the same day we arrived the same day we met in the university and we became friends we were living in the same uh, facility and all that so he invited us oh let's go and see man of steel and all that and he's somebody i've related with um to an extent and i felt that okay this guy is inviting us to go for this event and so we got we got to the cinema we lined up and he went to the counter you know, got some things, maybe tickets and all that. So I was just standing with my hand in my pocket and <laughs> with the Ethiopian guy waiting until uh, this guy, um, you know, because, uh, you know, when you go out with someone who is bigger than you in, in, in that sense, you know, levels, okay, this person is supposed yeah. to pay for this thing for me now, you know, so that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, so I was just standing and uh, we're chatting with, I was chatting with the Ethiopian guy and, and when it was time to go into the into the uh, cinema hall. Three of us lined up and then they took his ticket and he went in and then they turned to us and where is your ticket? And we're like, oh, well, we're with this guy. And he turned and he said, oh, you don't have your own ticket. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. Like you said, I did not come out with my wallet. I didn't have okay. any money on me. Mm. And then the Ethiopian guy, luckily the Ethiopian guy, you know, was with Owe. I don't know how, how it happened that he managed to come up with Owe. So he was like, oh, okay, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. And then he went and bought a ticket for myself and for himself. And I, that day I learned my lesson. Mm. I never went out without my wallet any day. <laughs> Anybody tells me, let's go out for lunch or go for dinner, I know that, okay, you are buying for yourself. 
Buy for yourself. You better you better look up the restaurant and see how much they how much uh, and, and get through and know how to prepare. Yeah. Or, or know whether to tell the person that you are busy that day. <laughs> yeah, which which sometimes I did. I think I did sometimes because as a student I didn't have the money to keep going to eat outside yeah. every day. So sometimes I'll just tell them, Oh sorry, I'm busy today, I can't go, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and people will choose like really, really fancy places to, you know, say, let's go here. Mm. And then and you're wondering why is this person asking me to come here when the person doesn't hasn't asked me if I have the money to to mm. to my bills uh, yeah. okay no that's 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 really that's really cool no, it's, it's it's important for people to to you know to hear about these things mm-hmm. and especially to just start preparing your mind right to mm-hmm. and also if you know these things nobody ex- nobody really explained these things to me and from what you're saying nobody explained them to you you never heard them yeah. and then it just went and you know it hit you and it could be it could it could be very embarrassing moments like your cinema um, yeah, story. it was quite embarrassing. Yeah. The cinema situation was quite really embarrassing. Yeah, and people might were even... behind us. People were yeah. behind us, so they, they they saw what happened and heard what were you know the discussion that transpired. And in the sense that okay, we're thinking this guy bought the ticket for three people, not knowing that he bought the ticket for himself. Yeah, yeah. myself and yeah. Now, so hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, could, could be yeah, could be could be really embarrassing. It might even be more than embarrassing, you know. So <laughs> just the it. You didn't, you didn't have your wallet with you. You didn't have any cash on you. If, the, if we could think of a scenario where it almost, it almost looks like, well, you're shoplifting or you are, you're intentionally you know, doing this thing or you're trying to steal stuff, but it was yeah. just that you, were, you had expectations that weren't realistic, right? Mm-hmm. Within, within, that, within that culture. Mm. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's 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 so that thanks for thanks for telling us about those you know misconceptions and I guess those are also and I was going to ask you about like the biggest challenges you faced I know I know that um, um, I know that what you've said now you know they were also part of your challenges but if I asked you separately what 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 are, what what would you say is like the biggest challenge you faced living in Australia if it's different from what you've just mentioned then it's fine or related and it's fine but if there's anything that stands out if someone says oh you know what's what's the thing that's really really challenged me what what, what would it be for you um maybe so eventually um during my studies i got used to you know those things and uh, didn't have any problem with them any longer when i understood that okay this is the culture of these people um what what i would say uh being my biggest challenge living in Australia would be tr- the you know coming from 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 Nigeria, I, my CV getting me that scholarship, and I remember I remember that maybe I was the second second uh, top um, ranked uh, applicant in that in our set then and all that. So there was this um, notion that okay oh this guy is brilliant, you know, or is, is, uh, is, is ready, you know, to face Australia. But I eventually realized that that was not true. So even finishing my PhD, getting good publications, having a record of having lectured back home in India for some time, and some other things, awards in my CV and all that, being able to have that valued was a very big challenge, really. Oh. Because eventually you, you'll be told, you don't have an Australian experience. Oh. You don't have an Australian experience. And you're like, what, what is it that you're talking about? Australian experience. Teaching in the classroom, publishing materials, oh. in high impact journals, oh. uh, winning awards as a student, oh. uh, getting grants for your, for your PhD, PhD research, so what is it that you're looking for? And, live, and living in Australia for those And living years. in Australia for some time, you know? So it, it looks like you still have to do something extra mm. to be able to meet up with what is, uh, what is needed or what is required of you, you know? So it, that challenge of proving yourself that you are, you are able to do this task 
you know, and do it perfectly and deliver results was quite a very big challenge, you know, to oh. me. So, um, apart from every other thing that happened when I was going to school, overcame them, but even up, up until now, I don't know if I can comfort, comfortably say that I've overcome that, you oh. know. So maybe my moving out of Australia, coming to, to like some, someone asked me a question a few, uh, maybe about two weeks ago, what are you doing in, in Spain? What are you doing in, in Ireland? So I told him and he was like, oh, uh, yeah, I know, I know. He said, we all know what is happening, you know, because he understood exactly what I was uh, trying to explain to him. You have things you have done and you think that they are enough. For, for them to prove to anybody who is looking at your documents and your materials that you can do this thing. But still, you know, uh, they want you to have what they call Australian experience. So it's a very big challenge. Uh. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I was, I was just posting in case Martin had anything to say. Uh, but I had, I had a, Martin, were you? Yeah, no, I was just going to, follow up on what he mentioned was uh, that biggest challenge for him and i mean thankfully it really ties in with one of the things we hope people can pick out from this for you yeah. uh, at the time you were going and after you completed everything you needed to complete there's just no one that would have told you to prepare for something like that and there's just no way you would have anticipated that after doing your own share you know no. if you've You've essentially crossed everything that was right in front of you. You you carried out your own responsibilities. Now, what's this new on head criteria that I need to meet? So, that is what nobody can tell. You get that's what nobody can can tell. They they have um, this idea that okay, whatever it is that you've done from wherever you're coming, um, maybe it is substandard. Uh, for you to show that you can actually do it, you need to have done it or had the experience here with us, under us, you know? Um, so without that, um, maybe you are still learning. Maybe you are still in the process of developing the proper skills that is needed for you to you know, be able to fit in into the system. So uh, really, I can't really, I, 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 can't, I can't say, because deep inside of you, you know, you've looked at these things, you look at the criteria and uh, what, they, what is uh, required you know, of that particular role. And you tell yourself, I have all these things. I mean, I can do it. I've done them before. Yeah. And then, but still, you're not able to break through and all that. Um, but that, so, that, that leads me, that leads me to, to wonder, so, you know, I, I really, like in Nigeria, we have this, we have this U, U, US, UK, Canada, Australia, you know, these are the, these are like the four top destinations, US, UK, Canada, it's just like, it's like a song, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I am aware of the immigration kind of um, situations in the UK, you know, the barriers, the limitations, the challenges and how it works. But I'm not sure I'm very familiar with that of Australia. You mean immigration? Um, yeah, immigration, for instance, in terms okay. of yeah, immigration, like, so if somebody comes to Australia, does a, does a, a master's or your, in your case, a PhD, mm -hmm. and what, what are the chances of that person, if it's for someone who wants to continue staying, what are the chances? How how is it? Is it how easy is it to convert them? You know to get a job because in the UK here it's quite challenging as as well. Mm -hmm. um, although recently they are they are introducing this you know, new two year post study visa for for people who study in the UK, but before now it's if you did a master's you have four months after that you you you're out. And I I used to think that UK UK has the strictest regulations. Could you compare it with Australia? What 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 are the terms in Australia? If you did your master's or a PhD in Australia, what well, do you have some years to work to get experience, or do, are you kicked out immediately? And how easy is it to become like a permanent resident or you know get a visa for work and stuff like that? Could you just share briefly on what the system is like? Yeah, um, I I also think that Australia is the the system in Australia is quite straightforward. Uh -huh. So it makes me think that it is easier um, compared to the UK. So in Australia, what you need to, to 
first thing is to have a skill that is in their occupational list before you now even start i mean thinking of uh, whether you have a master's or phd because Sorry, if you have well, a and when you say when you say occupational list what, what do you mean <clears throat> So every, every, the federal government has a list of occupation or skills that they are looking for. Okay. So every year, I think by June of every year, July, June, July of every year, they, put, they get out a new list. They do an assessment of uh, the labor market in Australia and then they identify the most um, important or relevant skills that they need at that particular point in time. So they list them on this, li on this list. It's called, it's called skill occupation list. And every state also does that. So the state will also produce their own list to say, okay, we need people with this skill or that skill in our state. And all the, so the first thing to do is actually to make sure that whatever uh, skill you have, whether you're an animal scientist or a chemical engineer or um, a nurse, whatever it is that you're doing that is your profession, that it is listed on that list. And sorry, and then, sorry, I'm sorry to jump in. Is this this is this skill as per skill, or is, does it have to be like what you studied there? Yeah, like so the now it is uh, it is what you studied plus your skill, your skill okay. or your experience. So you're not just okay, okay an animal science graduate, and okay. then you go ahead and apply because there is animal science on the list. You need to provide evidence that you have work experience. Mm. Yeah, so that is what they will now use to do yeah, your kind of a skill. So because you have a skill assessment, so when you see yeah, that your skill is on the list yeah. or your field is on the list, you now go ahead and do what is called skill assessment. So with that skill assessment, if, if, we, if it comes out positive, then you can now start processing your permanent residency application. But the other rules that, are, are that you also need to look at is your English language proficiency uh, that you have stayed in uh, uh, okay so well, for the permanent residency really you you don't need to stay in australia for any you can apply from anywhere in the world you can apply from nigeria you can apply from anywhere in the world the more important thing is do your skill assessment identify that you have a skill on the list you know conduct a skill assessment get a positive assessment and then meet a particular point so it's a point-based system where you need to score a minimum of a particular point to be able to now submit an expression of interest. And that, that, those points are determined by your age, your, the highest degree you've obtained, whether it's master's or PhD or first degree, mm -hmm. and whether you studied or you got those degrees in Australia or outside Australia, whether you, um, you have worked for a particular number of years or have not worked, whether you studied in a regional area in Australia, and uh, your English language score as well. The better the English language uh, score from IELTS or PTE, the more points you get from each of it. So these all come together to give you a certain number of points. And if that mm. point is up to the minimum that the immigration department had set, and you have a good, uh, a positive outcome of your skill assessment, then you mm. can go ahead and apply. Mm. So it's quite straightforward. It's not. It's, but, I think it's okay. Not but say say I, say I come to Australia. I do a PhD. Um, okay, let's let's say masters because not uh, more people do masters and do PhD. I mm. come to Australia. I do a masters. Does that automatically confer on me in a, a number of years that I can work there before they're talking about you need to leave now? Yes. So in Australia, they have what they call the post. Um, um, uh, what is it called again? Postgraduate, uh, post work, post 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 study work visa. Okay. So they have a temporary post study work visa that uh, gives you either two years or four years. So if you if you did a PhD, you get four years of it. If if you if you if you're successful in the application, four years of it. But it doesn't confer any permanent whatever to you. You're still here on a temporary visa. The only thing is that it allows you to work. I mean, as much as you want to work in Australia and you pay your taxes and all that. If you did a master's, they will give you two years extra on the post-study work visa. Mm. Um, so and it's, yeah. not, it's not automatic. No, it's not automatic. It's, no, no, no. it's not automatic, but um, most people always get it. Okay. Most people always get it. Um, mm. and, and it is not, it's not a very difficult visa to secure. Okay. No? Yeah. Okay, I think but I mean, it's not automatic here. Yeah. I think that's that's similar to what the UK has, what the UK did some time back, and they've come back to it now. 
in terms of the post study post study work visa. So if someone if you had a if you had a relative or a cousin or a dear friend in Nigeria who is <laughs> Who is saying to you, you know, I really, I really want to come to come to Australia. This is, you know, this is like, this is like my life dream. You know, this that's all the person is thinking about. You know, you, you probably know that this person has a lot of misconceptions. You've mentioned some of them already. Um, what what will you what will you say to people who think that it is necessarily better if you are out of Nigeria, you know, anywhere? Maybe you can say from an Australian point of view. What what would you advise that cousin or that nephew or that friend of yours if someone you know came to you with such ambitions or such plans? Well, so uh, if I have someone like I have a lot of people who who talk to me every time that they want to come to Australia and uh, yeah, so I tell them that first of all, just zero your mind that there is no money making uh, machine. In Australia. you if if you come to Australia and there secondly there is no guarantee that you will get a job immediately even if you are one very powerful professional back home in Nigeria well you 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 have to prepare to hit I mean go back to zero and start building up again in most cases. What, what, do you mean by that? what do you mean by prepare to go back to zero? To zero, because when, like I said, when you come in, they have this, this mindset of Australian experience, not having worked in Australia before. Now, I'm not trying to say that there are no people who got, who got a job uh -huh. directly without living in Australia. There are people who, who are lucky to, to do that, you know, to, to have that kind of opportunity. But majority of people who come to Australia mm -hmm. will have to go back to do something else and build from there. I mean, you have to for, just forget about whatever it is that you're coming, for, coming with from Nigeria. Just leave it, humble yourself, leave those things, you know, get into the system and get that Australian experience, even if it's for one year or six months. Mm -hmm. Then when you go into the system, you can now begin to show, oh, I actually have this. I actually have that. I actually have this. I actually have that. They will now begin to see more relevance in, in who you are or what you can do. But if you just come, hey, hey okay, this, that. Um, I used to be this. I used to be that in Nigeria and think that, okay, they will just absorb immediately. It doesn't always work. So there is the need for people who really want to come to Australia to prepare their mind for anything. Yeah, prepare their mind for anything. And I mean, I can give you an example. When I finished my PhD, like I said, I was thinking, okay, with my lecturing experience, number of publications and awards that won, that I'll be able to get into the university, one of the universities in, in Australia easily and all that. But it didn't work like that. It didn't, it didn't work like that. And to tell you, it's still the same CV. I think I was telling some guys yesterday, yeah, in, in my webinar yesterday, I was telling them the same CV that couldn't get me, get me a job in the university in Australia, gave me a Marie Curie fellow. Mm -hmm. There was no difference in it. What was I doing for the past years? I was working outside, outside research. I was working outside academics. I was working in a field that is totally out of my area of expertise. I was working, I am an animal scientist, but I was working in a crop production company. So I was working as a quality control, a quality assessment, uh, quality, what is it called again? Quality assurance and assessment um, officer in a company that is into crop production. The biggest um, crop producing company in Australia, you know, out of, totally out of my field of expertise. But for me to be able to push ahead, I, I need to do that. You know, I need to do that. Yeah, so, and if I, if I were like, okay, no, I have a PhD and I must, I must uh, get a lecturing job or I must be a, 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 uh, uh, a researcher in Australia and all that. Maybe I'll for don't kill myself. <laughs> I, have, yeah. I have, had a family, I need to take care of the family and all that. So what I did was to humble myself, use that as a, a, a period to hold myself together while I kept on looking around here and there to get some. So the, anybody who wants to come to Australia must humble himself to face anything that will come his or her way. Number two, 
don't just come to Australia because you want to come. I say, I say, I, with what I know now, if you if you don't look at the skill list and you come to Australia, you have to start afresh. Like you have to start from first degree completely to be able to get yourself into that skill list. So if you okay. think that you come to Australia and then you study um, anything, I mean, for people who want to base, I mean, live in Australia, right? Yeah. If you don't want to live in Australia, you can come and study anything you want and go back to wherever you want. But if you have the mind to come to Australia, the first thing you do, to do is, okay, look at my, this is what I have. This is my background and check the skill assessment. Is there anything related to this in the skill assessment? If it is, yes, then you can come to Australia and start thinking of doing your master's and PhD with the mind that, okay, I'm still in the same field. I can get a job, you know, mm-hmm. and then I can use the, the two years or three years on that job to get get uh, my assessment done and then I can apply to become a permanent resident. So before you come to Australia, make sure that you're coming with a skill that is relevant to the society, relevant to the country. Don't just come because uh, everybody is coming to Australia and all that. If you come with a skill that is outside that, you will you will remain a temporary resident all your life or you'll have to go back, take new courses in those fields that are relevant to, to the country and um, and then build yourself up to be able to apply. And that is what so many people do. You know, I have seen people who come to study a particular subject and then when they got here, they realize, oh, I mean, with this thing, I will not be able to remain in Australia. They will quickly yeah. change their course to something that is on the scale list. Mm. So think very, very well um, and make sure that uh, you are in order. That's the second thing. The third thing is there are some basic skills that um, I took for granted when I was growing up, you know, in Nigeria, something like driving, um, which one again? Yeah, so driving, you know, some basic skills, because the society is totally different from us. Yeah. You know? um, it, back home, I can just, like, if I don't have money, I can just maybe call somebody and say, give me some money, uh, I'll give it to you back. I'll give, back, give it back to you after two or three days or two or three weeks and the person will give to you. So, you know, some of those things are not obtainable in this part of the world. You can't just yeah. call up anybody and then get money. So, if there are skills that can help you to um, be able to do other things while you're, you're studying or, or even if you're not studying, to keep yourself going, to make sure that you don't have any restriction in... in your everyday life, those things are important. For example, I realized that without a car, it's very, very difficult to move around in Australia because Australia doesn't have a very good transport system like uh, other parts of uh, Europe. Um, So a car is not a luxury, it's a necessity. But when I got to Australia, I didn't have a driving license. You know, so it was difficult for me to go for events, go for activities. If I had to go to anywhere, it had to be places that I can go within, I mean, short distances I can walk to and walk back and all that. So um, think about some, some basic skills that will make life easy for you to live in a foreign land um, and, uh, and then pick them up, you know, because without, without those skills, you will find it difficult to actually fit in and get um, a very smooth life going in the, yeah. in the environment. So one, just humble yourself and take it, well, I mean, take it that anything is possible, like I could, I could just find myself in where I don't expect and just take it that this is a stepping stone to have an opportunity to express whatever gifts and potentials you have then to make sure that whatever it is you're coming to do aligns with what the country needs. And then number three, it is important to pick up some simple skills that you know, we think are not important you know, back home. Um, even bicycle, bicycle riding as well. You know, uh, I, in those, I don't know how to ride bicycles. I, 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 I was going to ask you, you don't know how to ride bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> Even in Spain here, they, gave, they were like, oh, there's a bike. In the university in Australia, there were bikes. But I couldn't take any of them because I didn't know how to ride the bicycle. In mm. Spain here, again, it's happening and all that. So, yeah, some of these little, little skills, even IT skills, um... And the, why, why these things are important is because they could give you a job that can you know, be providing you with an extra money, even if you have a very good job that pays you. It could give you two hours or three hours extra of job that you can, you know, can bring in extra income to you and all that. I had a friend from uh, Togo 
who was driving the international office uh, bus on a part-time basis. He was doing PhD like us, but he would, he would you know, go to the airport to pick new international students. And the university was paying him for that. You know? So even though I'm talking about driving to be able to move yourself around, but I'm talking about skills that can even give you extra income. Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's good. Um, I was going to ask one question when you talked of humbling yourself because there might be a need for you to let go of any experience that you have built up from yeah. Nigeria or from wherever you've come from mm -hmm. and, and kind of go back. Um, you touched on your own example and that was very useful. I was going to ask whether you could also touch on how some people have had to cope. So for people that have moved mm -hmm. and they realize that that's the situation, what have you seen people do to cope with that shock and then, you know, just that economic uncertainty for them because they weren't expecting it? What have people had to end up doing? Yeah, so, because you know, our people, one thing with our people is that we, we are very resilient. Um, I don't know about people from other parts of the world, but um, the Nigerians, mostly Nigerians, you know, that I, I, I've met in Australia are very, very resilient. Um, they, they, I mean, they just go out of their way and, um, you know, get it going. And they, so, so some of them, what they do is when they come, they kind of, Take some trainings. As a matter of fact, immediately you're landing here, they will tell you go and do aged care or do disability and all that. And you see many of them not caring, doctors, engineers. The most important thing is that in their mind, they know where they are going to, right? Like, I'm, I'm just not coming here to do this for life. I'm just trying to build a base or build a platform and then shoot off from there. So, uh, people, Nigerians who come here, um, don't find it very difficult to fit in. They know that, okay, this is just for a short time. So what they do to survive in, that, in those situations is either they go in for it and do and just, you know, um, do the job for a year or two. Not, many of them don't even do it for that long because as they are doing it, they are pushing here and there as well. Uh, but some of them, what they do is they, they go in and take some training. So they prepare ahead of time. Um, you enroll in maybe two weeks or three weeks training, learn a new skill that can get them something that they can do. Uh, and then they just go into it and do it for a short time. By the time you hear their story again, you, you hear that, ah, okay, uh, John has moved to Melbourne. He got a job as a uh, uh, control something, something engineer, uh, you know, like that. He has eventually gotten what he, he wanted. Mm -hmm. So um, most people, just go in, humble themselves and go in and do it for a while. But as they are doing it, they have something at the back of their mind, you know, that this, this thing I'm doing is just to, to pass time while I get, I try to get what I wanted to do. And then the other guys uh, may not um, just go into, into whatever it is that comes their way, but rather try, try to kind of um, be a little bit um, directed by taking some trainings, you know, and then through those trainings, they're able to get, maybe things that would be more relevant to their field and do, do that for a short while and then um, create a path for them from the, for themselves from there. I just picked up something as you were, as you were talking that I feel is a bit ironic. Just going back to what you said about that requirement of, of experience from the country you're in. Mm. But you've also now touched on how people people kind of use things like healthcare or, well, well, not healthcare, but, you know, like care jobs as a way of, you know, just getting some money to start with, but also now building some of that experience. Yeah. Now that now leads me to think, why is that experience from that place not such a big deal when you need to do care work or some of those ones that allow you you know, use it to build. Why is it different? You have worked on that. So eventually when you're applying for the next job, an Australian is going to give you a reference, right? You're going to get your reference, a referee report from an Australian who they can confirm. Um, 
his identity or whatever in the country. And it doesn't really matter. Maybe they feel that, okay, they can trust uh, referrals that come from their country compared to referrals outside of the country. Um, but you, you never can tell because anybody can give you a referral. You know, so. <clears throat> so, but the fact that you've worked, uh, maybe because you've worked in the country, you know um, how things are done and then they have, they have, they now have your, they can easily track your record uh -huh. in regards to your commitment to job, your uh, ability to be trusted. Um, what kind of staff would you be at the end of the day? I know that maybe the ability to access some of those data will make it easier for them to now open up the door for you. Uh, yeah, you know? I, th I think I was, it's also just from the perspective of to even get the job as a care worker they suddenly don't press too much for that Australian experience. I mean, I'm guessing is because there's such a requirement there. You know, there's such a need for, for hands in that space. Yeah. That they, look, if you are available, just, just come and do even if it means we'll run through one quick training for you. So yes. I just find it a bit ironic that in some of those spaces where there's almost a desperate need, ah, okay, yeah. no, you don't need to have Australian experience. That's fine. We'll come and train you. But when you now look for some of the jobs that you really want and you're qualified for, um, they now ask, uh, yeah, you need, you need Australian experience. Yeah, but another thing with the healthcare is also that um, uh, if, if you have, like I said, when some guys come in, they take maybe some few weeks of training in, in, in aged care or disability and all that. And part of those training is that you're required to do uh, a short internship. So that may be also another reason why it is a little bit easier for you to get it because they say they will say okay you've done two weeks internship so you've handled old people or people with disability before we can accept that as an experience and all that. I know that I have a friend whose wife whose wife uh, when she was applying, I mean she is working in aged care as well and uh, I think they asked her of experience if she has had an Australian experience but she didn't have an Australian experience. Um, but she's had some experience with looking after people or something like that when she was back in Nigeria. But somehow they they accepted it, but it was a long process. Bring this, bring that, do this, do that. Um, eventually she got it. So maybe because of those trainings that allows you to do two weeks or three weeks of um, of work, unpaid work with, with the, the sector, with what they consider to to be an experience and it will bring you in. But there is a point in what you're saying. It, why, why should they easily allow you to go into that? Because there is you know, pressure to get people in. But then in this yeah. other, other aspect, you have to not have an experience to come in. Yeah, 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 I see, I see the irony in that. But I think yeah. just thinking about it now, it also maybe ties back to what, what, you, call, what, what you talked about, that shortage occupation um, list. So they... Yeah. Uh, well, not, maybe not not directly, but they're, they're, they are all, they're always in need of people to do those jobs. So the entry barrier is kind of low. Mm. You know? and, and also, I think from my experience here in the, in the UK, it's also a kind of job that most of the you know, natives or locals aren't uh, most times willing to, to, to do. do. Yeah. So uh, it's usually, those roles are usually filled more, more by you know, the foreigners or the, the immigrants in the, in the country. The, country. So the entry barrier is low. So I think it, it also ties, ties back to that kind of shortage list where we, we need people to do this. We don't have enough people to do this. So, you know, come get a two-week training. It doesn't matter. You don't need, a, you don't need an Australian experience. But then if you need to get a job as an engineer and they say, okay, where is your... <laughs> there is Australian, Australian experience. Yeah, Australian experience, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge for a lot of people. It's um, professional. So maybe you have to go back and, and some people will even start from afresh to do some new trainings and all that. Uh, it's, it's really a big problem. Yeah, and I think what you said, I mean, we've, we've heard this thing like over and over, especially we've heard it from the UK, you know, Canada, we've chatted some people in some, some person in Canada, you know, this thing about you know, the expectations, you are in Nigeria, you're probably working as an assistant manager in a bank or a manager, but you've just said now that you should drop your bank manager status at the airport because you could be starting from ground zero. Yes. Mm. 
like it could be if, starting from if zero. You're, if you're if you're not coming in employed, if you're not yes. coming in, because when you get to Australia as a permanent resident, you know nobody is giving you any job. Yeah. Immediately you land at the airport as a permanent resident, okay. With yeah, whatever yeah. it is you're coming with, your PhD, your experience, and all that, nobody cares, you know, about, about, about you on your own. Because I used to think that, okay, when you become a permanent resident, you know, everything will just be there for you. And that's what many people who are coming from Africa think. That merely you get that permanent residency visa, you can just come in and the government will take over everything. No, you la before you get here, you make sure you already arranged your accommodation and all that. And the government is not going to give you money for that accommodation. Mm. Yeah. So there is no job waiting for you in Australia. Yeah. As a so if you're coming from Nigeria or anywhere and you're not coming as an employed, employed person, you know, to come in, which, which isn't, which isn't very, which is quite rare, you know, to very, get very rare, mm -hmm. right. very, very rare. So yeah. if, if you're coming as someone who just got a permanent residency visa or whatever, just you know, clear your mind of that big man. And if you come in and submit your application, and it works for you, I mean that's beautiful. You go ahead. But if it doesn't work for you, then know that you have to be ready for anything. It it happened, yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the, yeah, it's it's something for people to think about, you know, to think very hard about that this is possible. Yeah. It's not like you say, there's no job waiting for you in Australia when you come in, and but also it's even more important that it starts you start preparing your mindset, you start start envisaging, you know, analyzing worst case happen. scenarios. Yes, exactly. If this happens. Am I going to kill myself? Am I going to run crazy? Am I willing to? And take up with these other kind, kinds of jobs or just to survive. So I think that's that's really, 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 really helpful that you pointed them out. And at the end of the day, yeah. it's also I think it's important to note that we're not we're not faulting any of these systems at all. No. You know, like their, their own system because they've they've put it in in place for a reason. And I'm sure even there in Australia, there are some of their own nationals that were born there, lived all their lives there, that struggle to get jobs. So, yeah. um, so. The system is there, and it would be unfair for us to criticize the system for not having jobs available for people to come in. The, the point we're trying to make is for people to be aware that, look, if you're moving from Nigeria or from anywhere else, going to Australia with the mindset of, look, once you're in there, there's opportunities flowing all over. Yeah. For you to just, you know, get it right. You, you or or you even start picking money on the streets, you know. Or, exactly. Uh, exactly. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Imagine you're right about it, man. It's, yeah. it's what black people say it is what it is. You know? So mm -hmm. it's it's a system, man. You just need to know. And before you came, they, did, they didn't change the system overnight because yes. you came. that's the system running. Mm -hmm. And then you came into the system, you should have found out about how the system works. And so I think that's really one. That's that's really one thing that you know this program aims to achieve. This project aims to kind of create this awareness that people are aware of what they're getting getting themselves into because exactly. like like i mean there could be very very serious cases um people people could literally lose their minds when they come from a certain kind of status back home and then they yeah. come into a western country and or australia and and you know <laughs> they weren't prepared for the shock so it hits them really hard some people never come, come out from it you know yeah, yeah. it's something to be aware of no, oh, um, yeah, sorry, Martin. Sorry. No, I was just going to say one thing Ape mentioned was for those that, so it just ties to what you were concluding, um, Obina. But one thing he said was for people that come in and realize they have to start from ground zero, is mm. mentally being aware that that's not where they are going to stay. Yeah. As they're doing some of all those jobs they've started with, is being aware that, okay, I still know that this is the kind of job I'm looking for, but I'm just using this to get there. Yes, sir. Because yeah. if you don't, then like you said, it's it's hard to get out from that space. I mean, it is heavy enough just being in a new environment and dealing with maybe some of these culture shocks that Ape has also mentioned. Tying two of the things that both of you had said, because Obina, you talked about how almost mentally draining uh, and it could have a lot more impact on you, you know, apart from financially. Um, leaving your status in Nigeria or wherever it is you're coming from, and then now coming to find uncertainty in in a different field, 
in a different country. But one of the things that Pe mentioned was you know, in his advice was, you know, come in, take notes that you might have to do something, but while you're doing it, just keep it in your mind that you don't want to stick around here for long. Yeah. Always focus because that will guide your actions. I think another mistake a lot of people make is once they come, eventually they find something, but they miss that second part that I mentioned of, you know, still think of where you want to get to. And as soon as they found something, they just stay on it and then they just keep doing whatever, you know, whatever work it is. And then they stay there two years, three years, before you know what's going on, five years. And all the experience you've built in your five years have been here. So you now struggle to ever move out of it. Yes. And it's, it's um, I mean, we have cases like that, actually, in, in Australia. Where I, I mean, the little city where I live, there are cases like that. Some of them are Nigerians who immediately they get in. Um, and now we're, we're, we're not even talking about what we're, we're talking um, I believe that this is focused on people who um, have a vision for where they are going to. There are people who just come in. I mean, I just want to leave Nigeria for living sake. I mean, those guys, I don't have anything to tell them. But for people who are living with something at the back of their mind, they must make sure they keep that at the back of their mind uh, in, in whatever situation they find it. Because what you said is, is, is true. There are people who I know are working in a job that is much more less than what they are capable of. And they've been there for years. I mean, they are not even making any effort to move away from it. You know? mm. so whatever it is that happened to them, I don't know. But uh, they, these people are people that when I look at, I feel that, I mean, they are more than this. They shouldn't hold themselves down. Yeah. So it's important that if, you, if you're a visionary person who is really, really seeking opportunity, not just to leave the country, but to still remain relevant, you know, that you have that at the back of your mind so that you don't just get it. Because the money will be enough for you to pay your bills, right? Mm. Um, take care of yourself, go for holiday if you want. And, and they're just like, okay, what else do I need? Because I know that there were people who were like, what do you, why, 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 why are you going? You know, I had a position that was okay for me, quality, quality assurance officer uh, in a big company, biggest, largest company, uh, crop production company in Australia. And then somebody, why are you, why are you going? Why are you going? I was like, man, this is not what I'm called for. And it's not the money. Forget about the money. Forget about the position. I have some other things I want to do. And if this is not giving it to me, then I don't have to stay with it. I have to keep in searching and all that. But mm. some people just stay back. So long as they have enough to look after the pets and their families. It depends on what you want, I know. But if you want something more, then you must make sure that your, your eyes are on your goals at all times. Mm. That's, that's, that's really helpful, Ape. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, just you, your, your, your CV profile is, you know, it's, it's very intimidating. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> it's Everybody not at all. Have you seen my CV before? <laughs> <laughs> if, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to it's see It's not your intimidating CV. at all. There's nothing uh, there. The thing is, heard, uh, yeah, you can, I know you're, you're, you're saying thanks for trying to be modest, but I know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but just very related to our project and also something, one of the things that you've also been doing is you've been helping people, um, especially from Africa. I don't know if, whether you're also covering other parts of the world. You've been, one of the things you've been doing, apart from being an academic and being a, re a researcher and all, every other thing that you are, you've also been helping people secure scholarships. Um, in you know scholarships in, in in the West in universities to do their masters to do their PhDs, and um, because this is also you know related to our projects you know with the whole trial coming abroad or leaving your home, I would like mm -hmm. to just hear you you know speak briefly about that project that you've been doing. How how have you been helping people? What is it that you've been doing with people and scholarships? And maybe just share share that share a bit of that with us. Yeah, okay, so um, for, for some time now, I've been um, helping students from, from, basically from Nigeria, but more recently, people from other parts of um, Africa have become interested in it and have been participating. But what I was doing initially was um, just to help you know, some students, because I work with students in Nigeria and uh, I in during in my search for scholarships, I realized that there's a lot of information out there. I knew where to find those information. I knew how to put yourself together to you know take 
take um, those opportunities or maximize those opportunities. So I just, the driving force was, I saw that there were these brilliant students who I feel deserve these opportunities. You know, looking at what is happening back home and uh, coming over to Australia and having one of the best education for my PhD and all that. I didn't want those students to remain in, in mediocrity or something like that. I just wanted them to have an opportunity to excel. Yeah. You know? So I do, and, I, and then I now thought that the best way to do it is to help them. So it started by, hey, I saw this opportunity for masters. Uh, you can apply for it if you want. And then they will come back to me and say, okay, I want to write um, the research proposal. I don't know how to start with it. I want to write my personal statement. I don't know how to start with it. All those things, you know. And then I was like, okay, let me see if I can help you. And then those I could help, I will. I'll just do what I can to help them. And, you know. Uh, it started that way, and then um, last year, I decided to kind of formalize it into what I call the Scholarship Mastery Academy. And uh, what it is about is simply a platform that uh, gets students fit and ready for um, scholarship applications. Because um, if you have a 2 one, if you have a first class, very good, very beautiful, but from my experience, I've come to know or realize that getting a scholarship is much more than having a two one or having a first. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that come into play. Mm -hmm. um, so in Scholarship Mastery Academy, what we do is just to to help students become fit and ready to apply for scholarship, whether you're a first class student or a two one. And even some two two guys, there are a lot of things that they can do as well to secure a scholarship, but many of them don't know about these things. And we do that through trainings, we do that through webinars. So every Saturday, uh, we hold a webinar on a particular topic or a kind of scholarship and try to break it down and um, show them how to go about it. We do a lot of demos. Sometimes we, we share, like I share my screen and do live demo with them on how to identify a potential supervisor that could have money to employ mm -hmm. a, a research student and all that. And then we have an online course as well um, uh, that has some some modules, a few modules on about nine modules on how to go about all these scholarship things. Uh, and then a coaching and mentoring, which is a more deeper one-on-one -on -one, um, program for people who are also seeking scholarship. But above all, the passion is why the coaching and mentoring and online courses involved is because. Um, I come to realize as well that, or I came to realize that some of these students, when you try to um, help them, they take it for granted, they waste your time. Imagine helping somebody to prepare documents and all that, and then two weeks later you call him to find out, hey, how did, you, how did your scholarship application go? Did you finally submit? And he goes, oh, sorry, sir, I, I didn't have the uh, internet on the, the deadline day, so I couldn't uh, <laughs> submit the application or something happened to my laptop. You know, they will start telling you some kind of funny stories. So I just felt like, okay, it looks like um, some people, some people don't um, value your time and stuff like that. So now I carefully select those I give my time for free and then know those to push to the online course or the coaching and mentoring program. But the money is not my problem. My, my major drive is to see as many brilliant students who I feel deserve an opportunity to have uh, an abroad study experience to, you know, get that opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good. I think, I think I'm, I'm also, I think sometime in the past I joined your, I joined your, your group on Facebook. So where, where could you be found? You have a Facebook page, but what's how could you be reached? You have a website. So the yeah, we we have a Facebook page. Everything is Scholarship Mastery Academy. Scholarship uh, Mastery Academy. Academy. Yeah. Okay. So um, on Facebook, on Instagram, on on Twitter, on Telegram. Uh, then the website is scholarships.apparator.com. If anybody wants to go and look at it, it's scholarships.apparator.com. Uh, so there you find all the information about the online courses and uh, how the coaching and mentoring works. But for people who want to join 
uh, on social media where I share most of the sh of the of the of the opportunities is um, scholarship mastery academy across all platforms. Okay, mm. well, that's 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 really helpful, man. Uh, thanks. We have people like you, you know, inspiring, inspiring. But it's 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 little wonder you're doing this up here. You you went for a conference in Australia in your second year. <laughs> oh no no, no. The, the the conference was um, um, in 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 my masters, not in my second year. Oh okay, during your masters, but yes. but even at, even at that, man, you know it's it's so it's yeah. Even if we're doing, if even if it was doing your doing your PhD in, in Nigeria, it's 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 a very common thing, yeah. Yeah, mm. but I went to a lot of conferences uh, in within Nigeria as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. you know, it was part of those things that helped to build build uh, my interest and passion in in research and academics because we were going to virtually every animal science conference and like I said my my supervisor at the time was paying for those conferences for us so he would help us you know um, guide us to to write a conference paper and uh, if the conference paper is accepted. He pays for either the registration for the conference or our hotel accommodation, you know. So, but the one to Australia was uh, during my masters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's 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 brilliant, up there. That's that's brilliant. I hope people can find you on your platform and you know and benefit from all the all the stuff that you are you are giving out, Martin. I didn't know if you your body was if you had any question. No, no question. I was just really commending him as a follow-up to what you mentioned on on how much he, he has committed himself to you know expanding his knowledge and then now also sharing that knowledge. But on things like attending conferences, even while he was an undergraduate in Futo, it, it it wasn't yeah that wasn't a popular activity for most undergraduates. Let's just put it that way, especially especially for those that were in fields like his own it's just in many ways it almost seems like you you're very much ahead of the time especially with how popular agrotech has become in in nigeria and i suppose in the rest of africa now not that it wasn't there before but yeah because there was oil everyone was always looking after the oil yeah but you seem to have tapped into this space and not just taking it as a uh, okay, I'll just attach myself to this and see what becomes of it. No, you are actually still exploring it properly from from a very early stage. So no, that's very commendable. Yeah, cool. yeah thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I encourage even the guys who I work with these days on Scholarship Master Academy to to do that. You know, if anybody wants to uh, travel out of the country, go to conferences. You never can tell who you will meet. Join associations in your field. Um, subscribe to their newsletter. All, all of this, these opportunities are in, in the newsletters, in the journals, you know. Uh, read the journals, not just subscribe, but you read them, you will see opportunities that... And when you see an opportunity, don't just uh, push it away and tell yourself, oh, I'm not qualified for it, or it's something only for guys in the UK or US and all that. It does not matter. The most important thing is to try. Yes, is to try. It is their job to not say no to you. I mean, it's not your job to say no to yourself. Yeah. And that's what, uh, but I encourage them, if you can, um, go to conferences, uh, join associations, and try to maximize the information you get from there. You know. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I, I was just smiling because I, I, I kind of understand your kind of person. You, you know, you just go for every opportunity, you know, try things, you know, <laughs> throw yourself, put yourself out there, like you've said here already. You know, it's, it's really, really, you know, just, drive that motivation and that positivity as well you know like you said give it a shot and what was the worst that, that happens you don't you don't get it so yeah i think i think you definitely someone to to hang around more with uh. <laughs> if someone is looking for uh, uh, for who to hang around with um okay so back to back on track now i think we are just actually rounding up now um yeah. would you go back to nigeria some point do you, do you have plans to go back to nigeria what what's what, what's the long-term future plan like so you see i remember when we were talking about how i came to australia i mentioned to you that i just wanted to study abroad i didn't come with anything at the back of my mind really 
you know, I was just inspired by people's story and I felt that I can do this and I believe it will help me. You know, I never came to Australia with the mindset to um, leave Nigeria completely. My plan was even after my PhD, I'll just go back to my job in Nigeria. But uh, things started happening, seriously, things started happening that uh, it got, got me discouraged, really, you know. Um, I used to be one of those guys who believe so much in Nigeria, so much. And till date, I still believe in Nigeria, but I don't know if it is Nigeria of today or the Nigeria of the future that I still believe in, you know. Um, I, I was in Kogi State University and things were okay by the time I left. I went back after a year and three months and things have changed drastically and I was like, oh, okay. But I was like, okay, when I finish, I will go back. By the time I finished my PhD, the enthusiasm, the, the drive had dropped maybe to 40% or 30% out of 100. So what I thought I would do was, first of all, to attend to my family, take care of my family, make sure my family is settled. And now that that has been done, if I have an opportunity that is worth going back to Nigeria to stay, to live and do my work, I will go back to Nigeria and do my work. But for now, I'm not too sure. Like we have a company in Nigeria that is functioning even without my being in Nigeria. Two of my partners are back home and they are looking after the company and I know what is happening in the company from here. Um, maybe that would be a reason to go back to Nigeria tomorrow, depending on, depending on how the company prospers and all that. So there is a possibility to go back someday, but when that will be is what I don't know. You know when, when that will be is what I don't know. Um, I've not given up completely on Nigeria. I, I believe that something will happen, but I don't know if I'll be alive when it will happen and all that. If any opportunity comes that is worth it, especially opportunity to make an impact, fine. If I have an opportunity to make an impact, if I'm given the chance to contribute to what is happening, like as I am now, I believe, and I think you guys believe the same thing from your experience living out, out of Nigeria in this number of years, or over the, this number of years. So I have this belief that if I'm giving something, there are things you can give, you give to me today and I can assure you that it will thrive. You know, it will be an opportunity for me to make an impact in the little, I mean, sphere that that, that will, you know, uh, be allowed to impact. So if I have that kind of an opportunity, to make such impact, I think I will take it. But if it's just to go back to Nigeria and just sit and relax and, and you know, just live like in Nigeria, no, I'm not sure that will happen. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's good to know. I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, yeah, it's, it's something that's, something that resonates with me and I guess with many people as well. You know, there's that thing about, you know, just come, come over, do your study, do a master's, do a PhD, you know, go back immediately. But then, you know, while you're at it, kind of things change, like you mentioned. <clears throat> it might even be a change, like, you know, things maybe get worse where you thought you were going back to. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's even maybe your mindset changes are you in a way in ways that you you're not able to keep track of over these years and then it it feels like you feel if it almost feels like a fish thrown out of water mm. or it's it's something again that's best experienced than than described because someone might not understand understand yes uh, when you're saying something like mm. this yeah. yeah i think it was more of things getting worse and people not people not valuing what you have uh, people not getting worse, people not valuing what you have, and uh, um, people not respecting um, established order or established law. So you have, an, you have a law, you have an order that is in place, and someone comes in 
and thinks that, okay, because he or she is, is in power, he can do anything or she can do anything, irrespective of who is involved and all that. So not respecting, respecting what is already on ground, what an, for probably an agreement that is um, already established and uh, all that. It makes you feel like, okay, so if you're not even on ground, these things are happening. What will happen if, if you're on ground, you know? So it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, so when you think about all those things, uh, you just you know have to you know tell yourself the truth and be sure that when you're going back, you you are really really ready to go back and face all those kinds of things where um, people will make make rules and break the rules because they think they are in authority. You cannot do anything. You cannot say anything. Um, I try to give give some help, and they feel that okay, you are trying to show us that you just came back from Australia and stuff like that. So, yeah. when you look at all those things, you really have to think carefully before you, you know, make the move. So, and like I said, for me, I was I was like, okay, if it comes to that, I will. But let me first of all take care of my family. You know, some of my friends were laughing at me when I eventually got my permanent residence. And, uh, you told us you are going back. So, what are you doing now? I said, well. You will not understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What what do you what what do you miss most about Nigeria? Even though you are, even though you are, even though you are here, and mm. uh, you know, kind of, you've got you've got used to the society to a good extent. But what what is it that you miss most about Nigeria? The top thing or the two things you miss most about about Nigeria. home? Yeah. yeah. Uh I I back I miss this um uh the my friends I think I miss the time I spend with my friends and how I spend the time that is one um not that I don't have friends here you know um, but looks like everything is just like uh transactional you know, exactly, if I can use that. I have friends that I can just wake up and then go to their place and I want to stay with them as much as I can. Nobody is there to like welcome you with open arms. Uh, come over to your place, you spend time together as well. I mean, there is this fun that is is lacking in... in um, the experience I have so with that community, that community yeah, thing exactly you. you know that community sense mm. of belonging mm. I think I am missing it so much mm. I'm missing it so much uh, what else am I missing in Nigeria uh, what else maybe, you're, maybe you're not missing the food too much because you're married and your wife <laughs> is uh, bombarding you with this uh, <laughs> no I, because I'm not missing the food too much because I'm not a a foodie i'm not a food food person like i can go on the whole day with just one one meal and that's enough like i don't have a favorite food people ask you what's your favorite food i don't have a favorite food at, at all so i uh, i wouldn't say it's, it's surprising right but yeah i wouldn't say i'm, I'm missing uh, i love african food there are lots of foods and i mean if i see now i want to eat like but <laughs> It, it doesn't mean like it doesn't mean that I'm missing those foods, you know, um, because food is not. Uh, I don't know. I just see it as something you just need to keep going. No, nothing really special. Uh, yeah. So I miss I miss having that opportunity to connect in a communal way with people back home in, in Nigeria. And the second thing I miss is um, I, I I work. When I was back home in in, um, in Nigeria, I used to work with young people a lot, a lot like one on one and uh, and all that. But that hasn't been possible since the past seven years because you know you just if something comes into your mind, you can just start up something and then people gather and all that. But when you come to the Western world. You can't start anything if you don't have work with children. I mean, people don't even allow your children, their children to come to you, you know, without knowing who you are and all that. So yeah. that yeah. part of me that loves 
working with young people and being in their midst and talking to them physically, you know, um, I think I miss it so, so, so much. I miss it so much. Um, I've not been able to do that because before you can gather people here um, in the West, you have to be a police check, this, that, this kind of training, this kind of, that kind of certificate. And, and I don't have time for all those things, you know. So I think I miss that, yes. I really, really miss that. <laughs> Yeah, so talking about talking about young talking about young people, uh, you know, this 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 also draws draws me to something that is always kind of I don't know, you know, some people we just have a burden on our hearts. So it's something that I've always I've always talk, thought about. So if you let's say you continue living in in Australia for for the foreseeable future, you know, many years, mm. um, many Nigerians or many people who travel, let's say, from Africa and move to the West, they always have this thing, and um, they always believe that they will be able to travel back home as as frequently as possible with their families to visit so that their children can at least know the culture, maybe know the language, even meet their grandparents, their uncles, their nieces, mm. uh, sorry, their, their uncles, their, their, their aunties and stuff. But the reality from my experience so far, from my observation, is that it's very, very difficult for people to manage that. First of all, it's really, really expensive. You know, people are just managing to get by. So they don't really get to go back home that frequently. Hmm. But even, even if they are able to go back that frequently, it's still not the same, really, because that child is born in Australia, is born in the United Kingdom. Visiting Nigeria for two weeks and coming back to spend the rest of the 51 weeks, it's, it's, not, it's not the same. That child is British. Now, I always think about, you know, this thing about roots, identity, hmm. and we all i think i think i i'm always up for our identity people knowing being very very familiar with it, where they come from and from observation i was chatting with martin about this some time ago it's like after something like one and a half generations after you it's your roots if you're that kind of a roots or ancestry kind of person it's cleaned out from nigeria because what happens is you know your child grows up here hardly going to Nigeria. By the time many years in the future we our generation we, we go, that child really doesn't have any roots in Nigeria. That's the truth. The child can really can't go back to Nigeria to leave, right? And the, the person now you know gets a family and starts his or her own family, that's your child. And you find out that the, the your grandchildren are totally cut out of Nigeria. Is this something so it's something I think about a lot. Is this mm. something that you think about at all and is it something that matters to you at all yeah um so i'm already having that problem remember i told you i grew up in Imo state so uh, um in a sense in a sense that i'm already having that problem with my tribe as an igala uh, having grown up in in the west i mean sorry in the east um that connection was lost growing up. Um, I did a lot of people I don't know in my, in my family, like maybe my uncles and aunties. I didn't get to know my dad's parents, as a matter of fact. I only knew my mom's dad, and that was it. So it's something that I have thought about, and I think we have discussed it, and my wife had ha have had a discussion about it before. So what we are thinking of doing, hope it works, is to have the kids do either their secondary school or primary, primary school may, be, may not be possible because I think my daughter will, will be going to primary school next year. So that won't be possible. We're looking at a situation where they will have to do part or all of their secondary school back in Nigeria. Mm. And then they can come back to wherever it is, Australia, whatever, it, UK or US, wherever they want to go for their, for their university study. So by doing that, we hope that we will um, be able to um, allow them pick up those roots and yeah. have them in the memory and maybe at least get to understand what is happening back in Nigeria, where they are from and stuff like that. And there, there seems to be a little bit of an agreement between I and my wife on that. 
we don't know yet. It's still many years, you know, to come. But I know I and my wife have had that discussion, and it looks like there is an agreement to, you know, allow them to go back home, do first three years of secondary school or second three years of secondary school before continuing with their university. And then another thing we are doing at home, which I am very, very bad at, but my wife is good at, is speaking um, local languages to them instead of speaking English to them all the time. And um, my wife is Yoruba, I am Igala. So my wife speaks more of Yoruba to them. I hardly speak Igala to them because we, did, we didn't grow up, I and my siblings didn't grow up speaking Igala that much. We were all speaking Igbo language, you know. Um, so on my own part, I think it is something that needs to be done because even like the Aboriginals in Australia, say for example, hold dear to their roots. They don't, I mean, the major problem between those who took over the land and the Aboriginals is this idea of wiping out the Aboriginal culture or Aboriginal roots. So they themselves, they don't play or joke with their roots. They want to make sure they keep their roots, keep their culture, um, and their way of life and all that. So I, I feel that it is something that should, you know, be maintained, even in my own uh, family. So if we can, we will send them back home for some time and allow them to pick up some of these things before they can even continue. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's mm -hmm. it. What's the story for you? Hopefully we will achieve that. Because, you know, these kids, when they grow, when they grow, they become something else. But hopefully, uh, yeah. you know, God will help us be able to hold them down to agree to go home for three years or six years. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that one, that, that one warrants an entirely separate conversation. So I think it would be good to find time to dig further into that one. Um, but yeah, no, for now, no other questions from me. Yeah, no, I think I think it's actually I think it's actually interesting that first of all you you have this conversation with your wife. It means that you, it's something that you think about, you know, you think it's important. We've actually had a chat with people who you know they, it's for them. No. You know, it's 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 what it is. So this is life. Mm -hmm. This is where this is where life has brought them and mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter that much to them. But and then secondly, also that you have this chat with your wife, and your wife is even thinking along the same lines. You know, that many people. We'll see what happens in the next. <laughs> we'll see what happens in the next six years. You know. No, let, uh, let's even say let's even say it doesn't happen, but the, there's a conversation on it, and yes. there seems to be an agreement or a pseudo yes. agreement about it right now. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that's even a good indication, because it will have been. It's possible that you mentioned that to your wife and your wife says she never wants to hear that from your mouth ever <laughs> if you if you want the marriage to stay so very very many people think it's a very it's 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 a it's it's a very crazy idea yeah but no that's 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 actually an idea people can explore right yeah um yeah but thanks thanks for sharing sharing that uh, with us and um, so Ape, um I don't know, maybe we should even just give you a chance to, if there's anything you wanted to say about the project or any general, any other last comments you wanted to mention or say just around what we've been talking about. Yeah, um, I, frankly, I really appreciate um, what you guys are doing. So that was, it wasn't difficult for me to, you know, um, agree to, to, you know, come on board because I believe that uh, this kind of if if I had this kind of opportunity to hear someone that, some other person's story, maybe I would have been better prepared um, huh. before coming to Australia. You know, I would oh. have known okay, uh, somebody in the same class with me or in the same office with me can actually see me on the street and not say hello and and wouldn't feel bad about it and save oh. myself all those energy I wasted. Like you know, so this is a, a, a worthy project that. A lot of people to be, you know, better prepared to face life outside Nigeria. So it, I don't know if I've seen anybody who is doing it. There may be, but I've not come across anyone who is providing um, in-depth information like this to people who are planning to come to Australia. I know maybe I've seen short videos of uh, what to do in Japan 
or what life is like in uh, Canada and stuff like that. But not in-depth discussion, people sharing their experiences, um, you know, one-on-one like this. So it's a very worthy project and uh, I hope it continues because I look forward to where it will head to. I look forward to the great or to the large um, pro, um, results that will come out of um, whatever it is that you guys are doing. So it's, uh, it's a worthy, worthy project. So you guys keep it up and then um, anytime you want to talk, um, just let me know. I'll come back and talk again. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks we'll, very much. We'll hold, you, we'll hold you to that. Though. Just stay yeah. close. To the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We we love hearing that because no thanks thanks for thanks for the you know for the for appreciating and commending us. And we really we really really because there are, you you would you would easily realize that there are many things that there are many topics we just touched on. We we'll have to move on because of time. Yeah, yeah but... it would be great to have you back on the you know back on the project again. Maybe we can talk on very specific things. You know, just like last thing we talked about you know, the ancestry or roots and stuff like that. So it would be good to have you back to flesh out some of these these topics in the future but thanks thanks for offering and we will we, we will remind you like martin said <laughs> uh, i'm grateful to be on the on the show really yeah. yeah very grateful thank you very much for having me yeah all right thanks very much Ape. thank you Ape. we'll be in touch then thank you very much martin yeah all right. have, have a nice time man.